well, good morning. Can you all hear me? All right, I'm gonna move this just so I can see it, but stay over here and out of the direct line of fire. Uh, and we're good on audio back there for our web audience. Hi, everybody. Uh, so I'm Nathan Schlicker, I'm an ER doc by training. So Eric has beautiful prepared remarks, I wing it. So we're gonna have some fun. We're gonna talk about the epidemic, the program we're working on, where we've been, and how we think we can do this, and the importance of building a community around this. So I'm sure you all know the opiate epidemic, so we've got some slides to cover it, but this is also one of those steal my talk kind of things. So if there's a slide that's a cool graphic you want, please take it. But this really takes a community in, so whenever I think community and solving problems, I always think of Mr. Rogers. And Mr. Rogers used to say that, you know, when I was a boy, I would see scary things in the news, and my mother would say to me, look for the helpers. You'll always find that people are helping. And to this day, especially in times of disaster, I remember my mother's word. I'm always comforted by realizing there's still so many helpers, so many caring people in the world. I think we can all recognize that the opiate epidemic is a disaster. And we have to find those people that are interested in solving this problem in a world where there are a thousand other problems to solve. I mean, I, I passionately believe in this. My career has you know, been focused on system improvement around opiates, but I'm not naive, as to say, naive enough to say that housing isn't an issue for most of our communities, let alone many of our addicts and those that are suffering from addictions. That you know, education isn't a barrier towards uh, much of their improved health status and health literacy. And that food deserts and a number of other social determinants of health don't matter. But we still gotta find the people that are passionate about this. And I'm glad that you're all here and I hope you share this passion with me. Uh, so we're gonna talk about the epidemic, the shared problem. We're gonna talk about how we can tackle the problem in the past, where we're going, and where we think we can be in the future. So this is me, you already heard this. That's just my pretty picture that says, yes, I do actually still work as an ER doctor, uh, despite being an administrator. So the crisis, you know, I, I see, you know, it, it, for my kids, I have, you know, three and a half kids, uh, that uh, I see two existential threats. You know, the, one, them becoming drivers, and I'm hoping that Tesla or GM or somebody will fix that by taking the car out of their hands, and I see drugs. So that's why, one of the reasons I'm passionate about this. These are things that I see as the greatest threats to my kids and I wanna work on them. But I think it's important to break down some of the mythos around drug addiction and this is one of the things that often gets lost. It doesn't respect ages, it doesn't respect boundaries of socioeconomic status, it doesn't respect class or family or social environment. And I live in Gig Harbor which is you know, the wealthy enclave of Tacoma for lack of a better term. And I'm amazed constantly by my neighbors and friends that are like, well, this will never be a problem for me. We live in a good part of town. And I always remind them the good part of town is where usually the good clean drugs are, right? Because you get them prescribed to you and you keep them in your medicine cabinet because you're good, responsible people. You're not going down to find heroin, at least not in the beginning. And when you look at data, you'll see that 60 to 70% of the people who started on opiates started on the good clean drugs and eventually couldn't find their supplier and became heroin addicts. This disease does not know boundaries. It does not care whether or not you've got loving parents. It does not care if you've got a supportive social environment. It will devastate our communities. And unless we all believe that and all are responsible for it and all get engaged, we're gonna miss it and we're gonna have still epidemics in our communities. This is one stat, you know, almost half of our deaths uh, from drug poisonings in a given year are due to opioids. And a lot of times you hear about deaths, but they really are the tip of the iceberg. For every single death, there's 10 treatment admissions for abuse, there's 32 ER visits for misuse, and the one thing that's staggering is there's 825 non-medical uses for opiates in the community. Now, so that, while 16,000 is a staggering number, and I think we should all respect that, that's over a million people a year in the United States that are suffering from addiction in one form or another or not medically using opiates. That's huge. You can just have the slides. You don't have to take a screenshot. It's okay. Can you, can you guys send those? I'm happy to. I, this is my steal my slides. So you don't have to take pictures. Just text this. I, I promise. I stole that one. Yeah. I stole that one from Core Rems. It's totally okay. You can steal it from me. But this is one of the other ones. You know, we got a problem. You know, we've got a problem in opiate consumption in this country. We have a lot of pain. We consume 80% of the world's opiates and we're 5% of the population. 99% of the world's hydrocodone. And if you watch the Zohydro debate, the current versions weren't enough. We needed new versions of hydrocodone. Now, we have enough prescriptions in this country that every single American could have a prescription once a year. 
I mean, that's just staggering. And that's not something that is as simple as, oh, we just prescribe too much. It's a cultural transformation that happened. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But we have to recognize we have a problem. Maybe access to healthcare is some of this. Maybe we should be at 10% of the world's opiates. I'll give you 20% of the world's opiates. We're at 80. We are a far way away from sane in my book. We've got to change this. And we know in Washington it's no different. Our little corner of the world is not special. You know, despite what your mom has told you, you're not that special snowflake. Uh, we have deaths in our communities. This is uh, DOH data, 612 deaths. Again, we see the same escalation into hospitalizations, treatment admissions, and unfortunately people non-medically using opiates. It's in our community. Whoops, now I'm drawing. See, this is the problem we don't. There we go. All right. Uh, we also know that there's this direct correlation. I can't say causation scientifically, but that sure looks like causation to me. More of it we sell, the more people die. Kind of fits, right? It's a linear curve, linear correlation. That would have a beautiful R squared factor on it if you were a researcher. Uh, and that's not getting any better until we work on the sales. We also know that opiates have been kind enough to step in and fill a void uh, that heroin tragically was you know, not able to meet supply and demand. So this is the data that shows dropping heroin utilization and increasing prescription drug utilization by, date, uh, by a decade. You know, we now have more people abusing prescription drugs than we have uh, doing heroin. I will tell you that data has started to change in the last uh, about three years, and heroin is making a, a comeback with a vengeance as we have started to do it. So as you heard talking about initiation, chronic utilization and treatment. As we start to cramp down on that middle phase, I think we're gonna see a lot more need for treatment, so I'm excited that you guys are working on that. We're gonna focus on going way upstream today and just work on the initiation and the addiction in the beginning phase. But as this data changes, we'll see more heroin come back into the picture. We also know, though, that your likelihood of continuing to use an opiate a year later is based solely upon how long your first script was. Now, again, not causation, but strong correlation. Your likelihood of in a year still being on an opiate, if I write you a single script out of the R, is about 7%. And this is state level data. I will tell you there are research published studies that say it's 8 to 12% out of the ED. You know, your likelihood of still being on it, if we write you for 30, jumps up to 30%. You now, that's a pretty strong risk factor. As I say, what in medicine do we do to you that we don't give you informed consent when I say you have a 1 in 10 chance? of still being on a drug a year later, and a drug that could kill you, and more importantly for me as an ER doctor is could cause life-threatening constipation and impaction that leads to me digging that constipation out of your tuchus, which makes you unhappy and me really unhappy. Uh, there are certain things in life I don't like doing, and that's near the top of the list. Uh, we don't talk about that much, and patients don't think about that. And so we've got to change that conversation of this is not simple, this is not easy, this is not 100% safe. And the governor's taken an interest in it. Two years ago, or a year and a half ago now, put out an executive order to work on this at all levels of agency. But this is one of those things that I'm going to be bold, despite having been a former state senator, and say this is not something government can fix. This is, has to be a community effort. This has to be changing our dialogue in the communities, has to be changing the way we prescribe, changing our expectations in hospitals, changing our expectations when somebody comes home and says, I broke my foot today and they gave me Motrin. Like, I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, all I ever got was Motrin for any broken bone. I broke lots of things. Now, my mom was a nurse, so maybe that biased my sample size. I freely admit that. But, you know, think about it. How often do we write narcotics for kids? Not very often. If we break bones, you know, most times they get Motrin and Tylenol and a little dirt rubbed in it. Yet somehow you turn 19 and now the world is not solved unless you have Vicodin and Percocet in it. So the governor's order is an acknowledgement this is an epidemic, but it has to start here. And it's not just healthcare. You know, when we look at opiates, we're not talking about this epidemic in our communities. We know that pain relievers now are the second most abused substance after marijuana by kids. Second most. Not cocaine, not heroin, or LSD, or PCP. Who still does PCP? Come on. Like, really? Uh, I have seen it every once in a while. It's kind of hilarious. We also know, though, that the opiates are not coming from the drug dealers. The one that I call out, you know, we see the legislature always saying, mandatory PDMP checks. We need to check a database. 
I'm sorry, that's 1.8% of the problem. 1.8% of the problem is doctor shopping, going to more than one doctor. 75% of this problem is that they got it free from a friend or relative or bought or stole it from a friend or relative. 25% they have a single doctor prescribing it. Your medicine cabinet is the worst place to store medicines. It's where you have a lock on and somebody can go shopping through your cabinet in the privacy of your home. So at a minimum, we have to get these out of our medicine cabinets and out of our homes. And the legislature this year passed drug take back. If there's a way the government can solve this, it's mandating drug take backs and putting lock boxes and opportunities for people to do that. But we have to get this out of our homes. We actually also have to start talking about it in our homes. Because remember, this is the second most abused substance after marijuana. We love to talk about beer, alcohol, and marijuana. 78 to 81 percent of adults will talk with their kids about it. Only 22 to 23 percent will talk with their kids about any prescription drug over, uh, abuse, whether that's Adderall abuse to get them a higher score on their test or opiates. I mean, community problem. Not in my community of Gig Harbor. We're a wealthy enclave. It can't happen there. It can't happen in my neighborhood. This is an inner city problem. This doesn't happen. It does. And until we start talking about it like we talk about everything else and telling our kids it's not a safe one just because it's a pill with a pretty stamp on it, we're going to keep losing the battle here. And we've got to acknowledge that everybody's had a hand in making this mess. I mean, the Joint Commission, the fifth vital sign. Somehow they deny that they ever said it was the fifth vital sign. And I'm like, there's this thing called the internet and Google. You can find this stuff. Seriously, people. Like, tell me a hospital that doesn't freak out about the pain not being recorded. You know, mine does. CMS said, well, we care about patient satisfaction and pain management so much, we're going to put it in the score on which we determine to pay you on. With a question that's so misleadingly leading that says, was your pain adequately managed? Not did they address your pain, did they consider your pain, but basically, did you walk out of there on a cloud, floating out into the ether, happy as a clam? And if we're doing that, we're not doing the right thing. So CMS played a role in our payment policy, Jayco from our regulatory, and then if you ever need a humorous uh, look at it, uh, John Oliver talking about marketing to doctors uh, does a whole segment on Purdue Pharma and the idea that we, in the 90s under Clinton uh, and the Gingrich era, we opened up uh, the ability to direct to consumer advertise and that's why you can see Viagra advertise at major league ballparks now. You know, in the old days, if you remember back when I was a kid, you couldn't do direct to consumer advertising. You know, but then you got the purple pill will cure all your ills kind of stuff. Uh, and we said pain was curable, that with chronic opiate therapy we can cure pain and there's no downside. And so we changed the culture for 20 years that now says pain is curable, we're going to pay you based upon how well you, sa you satisfy pain, we're going to judge you and rank you based upon your satisfaction about how well you do on pain, and we're going to tell patients that this is 100% safe. If that isn't a recipe for disaster, I don't know what is. And this is not something that just telling doctors to prescribe less or hospitals not, that you're not going to be paid on anymore is going to do. This is in our cultural ethos. I'm amazed at the number of times as an ER doctor I see a kid come in that has an ankle sprain. And I put him in a splint and the parents ask me, well, what are they getting for pain? Is it Tylenol and Motrin and some dirt? I'm like, well, but it hurts them. I said, uh-huh. Pain is the reminder of the human condition. You know, well, they need something stronger. I'm like, I'm not writing them for it. It's an ankle sprain. It's going to get better. Here's some crutches. Here's a splint. Here's some ice. Elevate, you know, Motrin and Tylenol. Let's go, folks. You know, but it's a cultural change we have to get to. We have to get beyond the myths. I mean, I hear these all the time. Well, if they have pain as a doctor, who am I to second guess or judge them? It's your job not to load the gun. Seriously. Well, if they have real disease, they cannot become addicted or tolerant. And this is still pervasive out in the literature. You look at how ER doctors write in the literature, we talk about addiction, about tolerance, about long-term risk. You look at family practice literature, they talk about misuse, and you talk, look at surgical literature, and it says the likelihood of ongoing need for chronic opiate therapy. Just the words we're using reflect where we are in this conversation throughout the House of Medicine. And long-term opiates are safe when properly used. No, they're not. You know, we talked about informed consent a little bit. You know, in those, this was a study done in Colorado. It follows the state data as well. They looked at those that were opiate naive, and 12% of them went on to still be using opiates a year later. Now, this doesn't control for disease severity. It doesn't look at where they all trauma patients. I grant you all of those study limitations. But it goes back to the fundamental question. 
Is there anything we do in medicine that 12% of the time we don't talk to you about the risks and the long-term complications? And we know that the world is changing for surgical guidelines. I'm not going to ask how many of you ladies in the room have had a hysterectomy or anything like that, but if you had a hysterectomy, hypothetically, would you be shocked that your doctor only sent you out with 20 Vicodin or 15 Percocet? Because I would be. It's usually 40 or 60. Or had a gallbladder taken out and you get 10 Percocet or 15 Vicodin. It's usually 30 or 40. This is Michigan's data and their open project, and they're really working to crack down on this and to really put guidelines in place and say, this is the community accepted standard. Because if we're being fair back to the surgeons, you know, we through regulation have put a lot of barriers into doing the right thing up front. How can you prescribe an opiate? Can you call it in? No. So it's a sat you do surgery on a Friday or Thursday, you give them 10 tablets, they have a lot of pain, they run out and they call you on Saturday at three o'clock as the on-call doctor. How do you write them for 10 more? You can't call it in, can't fax it in, can't e-prescribe it in most places, we're starting to change that. So you have to find a way to get a physical script wherever you are, go give it to the patient and then they have to turn around and take it to the pharmacy. So, you know, I'm getting a lot of calls when I only write for 10. Let's see what 20 does. Well, my call volume just dropped 50%, but I'm still getting some. Why don't we try 40 or 60? And we get to the point where it's the, don't call me on the weekend dose. Now, is that just the doctor's fault or is that because we've set up a system that has incentivized the wrong type of behavior rather than saying, we never have done narcotic refills, but maybe if it's for 10, we can put two refills on it and tell the patient, if it's really killing you, there's a refill at the pharmacy for you. Can we change the rules that actually incentivizes the right behavior? Because at the end of the day, this is all a balloon, right? If you push on one side, something pops out the other side. And we do these rules to try to stop what we think is one bad behavior, but we incentivize others. I did this talk a while ago for a group of providers, and a doctor raised her hand and said, well, you guys are tracking pills, so do you track the strength of the pills? I said, no, we're just looking at pill counts. And she said, oh, okay. And I said, so let me, Paraphrase what I just heard you say in your oh, okay. So you're gonna write for 10 milligram oxycodone now as a surgeon rather than five milligram to keep your pill count down and tell your patients to take half or one tab rather than one or two. She goes, well, yeah. I said, great. I said, so, you know, everything has a, a consequence. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. But we have to do something. So I'm not advocating for doing nothing. We need to acknowledge this variation pra practice and we need to work on pulling in the outliers. This is DOH data, looks by specialty, at the average number of pill counts for kids, 14 to 19 year olds, kids. Why 19 and 20? It's because of EPSDT federal reporting requirements, but kids, nonetheless. Average pill counts. If you go to an ER doctor, the best doctors in the state, you'll only get 15.2 tablets on average. Now I'll tell you when we talk about the program we put together seven years ago, why we're already the best in the state, because we've been doing this for years. But I'm gonna push on my orthopedic colleagues and say 48.9 tablets is your average first time script is too high. Okay, I'm gonna be that blunt. We got variation. Dentist, 22.3 tablets every time you get a, a tooth pulled. Seems a, sc a skosh high. I got Motrin and a slap on the back, you know, and a lot of ice and gauze shoved everywhere. You know, that was the <laughs> sum total of my dental existence. So, yeah. I, Pediatrics, they're doing pretty well, but we've got such variation and we've got to work on bringing this down because what happens if we go back to 75% of these drugs come from inside of our own homes in our medicine cabinets, if we drop this 48.9 down to 15.2 and every one of these down to 15.2, how many opiates do we pull out of our community? A ton, right? So the answer isn't no opiates, the answer is the right amount and making the least amount necessary. Oops, oh, well, probably nothing important in that slide. Uh, so this one, you know, variation does exist. Pill mills, right? The Seattle Pain Centers that were all across the state, 20,000 people addicted, eight deaths at least, and Dr. Frank Dangerly, by the way, the best middle name ever <laughs> for a guy over prescribing opiates, that's just too awesome, uh, had his license suspended, you know? But that was one. Again, if we're waiting for government to step in when we're over prescribing as a community, we're too late to the game. You know, I was involved in the work that it took to get to this stage and in how we were gonna deal with the consequences and the fallout of this. 
for one center. It was a massive lift. This is not the solution to how do we fix prescribing. And I'll argue that most people aren't the Frank Danger Lees of the world. They're good docs trying to do the right thing that over time have gotten to a certain point that is now outside of the norm as we change the practice. So the answer isn't punitive, it's education and feedback. And we also know that people are misusing these things. You know, in a study in UNC uh, they did, they looked at their uh, patients on chronic pain management, 32% were not using them as prescribed. You know, at the end of the day, we've got to follow up that accountability and we've got to change and make sure people are using them as prescribed or get them off these meds. And in case you've missed it, safety is no guarantee. This was the Pulitzer Prize winning Seattle Times story that when the state went and decided to save a buck by blocking Oxycontin off their formula and just requiring methadone at the healthcare authority, over 2,000 Washingtonians died as a result of that move. Again, a payment policy saved us money and cost us lives. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction far too often.